Addition and subtraction are the mathematical operations that describe orbital interactions. Atomic orbitals that interact produce molecular orbitals, and molecular orbitals are really what we're looking for in describing chemical bonding. In this webcast, we're going to take a look at the process of orbitals that interact and what it means for orbitals to interact. We'll take a look at a specific example. The specific example that we're going to look at is the combination of 2s orbital on atom 1 and the 2px orbital on atom 2. Here's the isosurface for atom 1. It's represented in blue. You can see that the inner core, which is shaded, is representing positive wave function from the Orbitron website. You can get an idea that if we take an axis right, say the x-axis that slices right through the center of that isosurface, we're going to have that inner core that's going to have a wave function that's positive and then negative in the regions that's unshaded. So these unshaded regions are negative. Atom 2 brings its 2px orbital together. We know it's the 2px orbital because it's symmetry axis. The symmetry axis of that shape is along the x-axis. It's the 2px axis. This uh, isosurface is represented by this red curve where it's shaded, it has positive wave function. Where it's unshaded, it has negative wave function. And that's represented by this one-dimensional tracking. If we protrude or follow the x-axis through the wave function, we see that it changes sign. There's a node at the center where the nucleus uh, exists negative wave function to the left, positive wave function to the right. In doing the LCAO, what we're going to do is bring those two nuclei closer and closer together until those two wave functions overlap with one another, and then we're simply going to add their values at, a, at, uh, at each point along the x-axis. So we're going to move those two curves closer and closer together, and when we do that, these regions will begin to overlap, and both of those regions are negative, and so the resultant curve will be a net contribution of negative wave function in between the two nuclei when they get close enough together. As we've brought those two curves together, you can see the resultant, which is represented in purple, and you can see this region in particular here. This region that I'm drawing now and shading now is that region where those two curves have both had negative values and overlap on one another. And when we add those two negative values together, we get an even more uh, larger negative value. And, and so if we look at this schematic representation of the isosurface, Here's the nucleus 1, here's the nucleus 2. Nucleus 2 has a nodal point that still exists because not much has happened to the wave function in this region here. There was very little contribution from the blue curve, and so there was very little change that took place in the wave function there. But most importantly, in between the two nuclei, in this region that I'm now shading in, there was a net growth of wave function, and so psi is increased in that region. When we square that, there's an increase in the electron density in that region. So bonding contributions, that's what this is, have an increase in the wave function, psi, and anti-bonding contributions have a decrease in the wave function, psi. And so that's what we're going to be looking for in the process of LCAO. Often you're going to see these isosurfaces drawn in this way, where now blue might represent negative or positive region and red might represent negative region. You can clearly see this region here where there's been an overlap of wave function and a net enhancement of the orbit of the of that wave function, or in other words, a net enhancement of psi squared electron density, which means that there's a bonding contribution there. 